need to um, read the scripture for today and to have our opening prayer. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9, and I'm reading from the Common English Bible, which is the version that our lesson book uses. I looked up several words to make sure I was pronouncing them correctly. So if something sounds a little weird, um, I'm just pronouncing it the way that I, my research showed me to. Abram's family moves to Canaan. The Lord said to Abram, leave your land, your family, and your father's household for the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and will bless you. I will make your name respected and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Those who curse you, I will curse. All the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. Abram left just as the Lord told him and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all of their possessions, and those who became members of their household in Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as the sac sacred place at Shechem, at the Oak of Morah. The Canaanites lived in the land at the time. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I give this land to you and your descendants. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who appeared to him. From there, he traveled toward the mountains east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and worshiped in the Lord's name. Then Abram set out toward the arid southern plain, making and breaking camp as he went. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving Father, we have spent the last several days in Thanksgiving gathered with our family and friends, thanking you for our bounty. Lord, we would ask that you would help us to be thankful all the year long, for we have been blessed. Lord, we thank you for our church and ask that you would help us to always point to your kingdom here on earth and in heaven. Help us to answer a call, any call that you would place on us and help us to be good stewards of our blessings and to be a blessing. Lord, please help us to follow this quote. God, may you steal from us all that steals us from you. It is in Jesus' name and for his sake that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Lee, for that rendition of I Wonder as I Wonder. And thank you, Eddie, for uh, the poem, beautiful poem that you read. It's 
good to be together on this first Sunday of Advent. Um, the text that Rachel read speaks of a family on the move. They're moving a lot. Every Monday, I go down uh, Old Hickory Boulevard to a teaching assignment over on Nolansville Road. And most of the time as I make that trip, I don't notice anything, it's just a blur. But this last Monday, as I drove down Old Hickory Boulevard, a red, a uh, blue and green truck stood out. It was coming in the opposite direction, um, and it had on it the name Good Time Movie. <laughs> and I thought to myself, where have you been all my life? <laughs> In a class this size, there's been a lot of moving over the years. I wonder how many of you have moved at least five times. A good, most of us have moved five times. How many, uh, ten, uh, at least ten times? Okay. A lot of moving. Any uh, 15 times? Cricket? Maryland? Yes, yes. Uh, John? Anyone move 20 times? Cricket? Okay, yes, yes. And I suspect uh, our friend Carl um, has moved uh, that many times, uh, served as an Air Force officer and uh, over a long period of time. There is a cluster of emotions that attend our moving. What are some of the emotions that you've dealt with uh, in the moves that you've made? Anger. Anger? Okay. <laughs> that, that's certainly one. Chuck? Anticipation. Anticipation, yes. Anticipation. Uh, what is the object of anticipation? What are you anticipating? <coughs> something better. Yes, something better. So uh, there's anger, there's anticipation. Other emotions that you, Rachel? Exhaustion. Exhaustion, yes. Yeah. That's, that's expectation. Yes, expectation. Joyfulness. Joyfulness as you move. Expectation for a better uh, a better time where you're going. Yes. Better here. Yeah. Better weather. Coming home. Yes. Better weather. Better weather. <laughs> so that's uh, that's hope, isn't it? Yes. Sadness. Sadness. Yes. There is a sadness, isn't there, in leaving where you've been for most of us, and uh, so we're caught in this mixture of various emotions as we move. I think that. Uh, Abram and his family uh, experienced these because they were thoroughly human. You remember the patron saint of uh, the disrespected Rodney Dangerfield? Remember him? <laughs> Said, when I was a kid, my parents moved many times and I always found them. <laughs> Today we look at uh, the move of our central character, Abraham, or Abram as he was first called. We want to go back before we get into the core text that Rachel read and look at the background of his family. We find that in the verses in the last part of chapter 11, just before chapter 12 begins. And I've given you uh, a picture, I'm sorry for the small, uh, text here on the board, but I'll, I'll try to interpret that. Terah was the father of three sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and they lived in a place called Ur, uh, Ur of the Chaldees, over here in Mesopotamia. Um, there's a very interesting thing about this family in that Haran had two daughters, Iscah and Milcah, and he had one son, Lot. 
Now, many people believe that Iscah was Sarah. So what you have in this family is Sarah marrying her uncle, her uncle. And uh, you have Milcah also marrying her uncle. Uh, Aaron dies early in life. He dies there in Ur. And uh, he leaves Lot. Uh, so uh, that's the family uh, from which Abram comes. Terah, we're told in the book of Joshua, was one who worshipped idols. And so... Uh, the call of Abraham probably began when he was in Ur. Uh, there is a Jewish tradition about uh, what prompted Abram to move in a different direction from his family. Said that uh, not only was Terah, his father, a worshiper of idols, but he was an idol maker. He had an idol making shop. And uh, at some point, young Abram became skeptical about what the family was doing in making these idols. And so uh, one day, while his father was away uh, doing something else, he took a hammer and destroyed all but one of the idols in his father's shop. He couldn't take it anymore. And he put the hammer in the hand of the biggest idol. He left the biggest idol intact. And his father came back to the idol shop. Uh, he came, there was a sense of apprehension. He knew something was wrong. And he looked and all the idols in the shop had been shattered except the one who still had the hammer. And he said, son, said, what happened here? And uh, Young Abram said, um, this largest idol got angry and he destroyed the rest of the idols. <laughs> and um, his father said, son, you know that idols could not do that because they are lifeless. And young Abram said, precisely, why are we doing this? You know that these are lifeless. You know that they are not doing anyone any good. And so that process of thinking, as the Jewish scholars have reflected uh, that part of the story, uh, set in motion in this family a move away from many gods, as uh, Bishop Pennell talked with us about last week uh, in Athens, to the one God. And so, um, in the last part of chapter 11, we have a journey, Ur, the family moving from Ur, only uh, Terah, Abram, Sarah, and Lot making this move up the Euphrates River Valley. So, uh, they are there for a time and then Terah dies at the age of 205. He lives to be 205 years old. And at that point, God continues to work in Abram's heart. He's 75 by this time. And so the family moves in a southerly direction, Damascus, Shechem, Bethel, and on to the Negev Desert the uh, path that they will take. Now, coming back to the uh, core text that uh, Rachel read, the first verse of chapter 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So the Lord begins with a command for Abram to leave. Leaving, as we talked about in the emotions associated with moving, can be difficult. The familiar is comfortable to us. The unfamiliar is not comfortable. On the other hand, there are the emotions of promise and anticipation, hope, that we've talked about here just a few minutes ago. And so uh, Abram hears this command 
from the Lord. I would like to know more about what that was like. You know, as we see television personalities interview people, whether it be politicians or sports figures or first responders, some big story has happened and the uh, reporter in interviewing the person will say, what was that like? We know what the event was, but we want to know more. Uh, let's say in a basketball game, a player makes a desperation buzzer beater shot full court and it goes in. The reporter wants to know what was that like? They want to know what was going through that person's mind. Uh, how, how were they able to do that? Or in a political sphere, you have a politician who's able to bring conflicting points of view together to pass legislation. And a reporter will ask, what was that like? How did you do that? That's what I feel as I read this first verse of chapter 12. What was it like to hear the voice of the Lord with this command to leave one's country, one's family, one's father's house, and go to a land that is yet unknown to you? I'm the kind of person that likes to know where I'm going. And uh, I can feel Abram's discomfort in not knowing the specific goal to which he was called. But there was something about that voice. There was something about the quality of the voice that assured him that he was on the right path and that if he stayed with this one who was calling him, all would be well for him. Walter Brueggemann, uh, an outstanding Old Testament scholar, says that this passage that Rachel read is like a new creation in Genesis. The first 11 chapters uh, show a lot of things going downhill in the world after the creation and fall of human beings. Another uh, Jewish scholar, John Levinson, says that uh, up until chapter 12 of Genesis, everything God is doing is really uh, damage control. And here in chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, God is doing a new thing on earth. He's moving uh, to one man and one woman, and he's looking to them to build a community, to build a nation that uh, will make a difference in the long term of uh, world history. We come to the second verse of, uh, which is the second and third verses of this chapter, which is really uh, a promise. We begin with a command. We now focus on God's promise to Abram. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. First thing is, I will make you a great nation. Now, he was just one man with one woman. She, at the time, was unable to bear children, and I think they thought she would never bear children. But the Lord said, I will make of you a great nation. I will begin uh, by creating a family, send a child. And you know uh, all of the difficulties that that promise was for Abram. It was very difficult for him to be patient over the years in waiting for that child to come. We know the scheme that he and Sarah came up with, uh, thinking to themselves, surely the Lord means for us to take this in our own hands. And so uh, the scheme was, of course, for him to take uh, 
her handmaid, Hagar, and have a child with her. We know that uh, that, mo that lapse of faith on Abram's part created more difficulty than, than solving problems. And so from that, Abram and Sarah learn. They learn what not to do, but they also learn that uh, their action did not exclude the blessing that God was giving them. The next part of the promise was that I will bless you. This word bless is a marvelous word. It's very short to the point, but in the scripture, blessing means the fullness of life uh, to a person, to a community. It's a uh, flourishing of body, mind, and spirit. And this is the promise that God would bless this couple and bless their offspring. He would make Abram's name great so that, uh, and as we look back in 2019, we see that uh, three of the major world religions look to Abram as their father. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. What God is saying there, if we said it in our contemporary uh, speech, I've got your back, Abram. I've got your back. I'm looking out after you. We know that Abram was tested uh, about in this matter when uh, during a famine, he and Sarah went to Egypt. Sarah was a beautiful woman, a most beautiful woman. And uh, as they approached Egypt to uh, be there during a famine, he said, Sarah, why don't we tell the Egyptians that uh, you're my sister and not my wife? They're apt to kill me uh, if they think that uh, you're my wife. And so uh, she went along with that. And we know that uh, the Egyptians indeed recognized the beauty of Sarah. They told the Pharaoh and he took Sarah into his house. All kinds of things bad begin happening uh, in Pharaoh's household. And he came back to Abram and said, why did you not tell me that she was your wife? And uh, Abram confessed and said, uh, I was afraid uh, that you would take my life. And so uh, Pharaoh sent him away from Egypt. He uh, gave him a lot of material goods just to get out of Egypt. So in that, uh, that was a lesson where he learned that uh, God did have his back, that God was looking out for him, and that uh, he could trust God. This process that we read in the life of Abraham from uh, Genesis 12 up through 25, we see many instances like this where he takes two steps uh, he taps, takes a step forward and two steps backward. And uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a learning process. God knows it's a learning process. And each of you can give testimony to this form of process that God puts each of us through. The final part of the uh, promise is that in you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That is a tremendous promise. God is blessing him, not just as an end in itself, although he is giving him the fullness of life, he is giving him a life that flourishes, but he's doing so also that he will convey blessing to the other nations of the world. 
And in the biblical story, as it moves on from Abram to his sons, as it, Israel becomes a nation and leaves Egypt under Moses, um, God is creating a nation that will convey his blessing to the world. The ultimate form of that blessing came in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago when his son, Jesus of Nazareth, was born. <coughs> the uh, event that we celebrate this time of year. And um, we are the beneficiaries of that blessing. And the same expectation is of us that uh, the blessing will be received and we'll be thankful for it but that we will be channels of blessing to um, the nations of the world. Last week, I uh, greatly appreciated Bishop Joe's reminding us of the symbolism in our pulpit, in the main sanctuary. Uh, as he pointed out that uh, that pulpit is like the bow of a ship. And it's a reminder that uh, this good news that first came through Abram and his offspring has come to us. So this ship has, has come to us. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it hadn't. But we have a part uh, in boarding that ship and moving with that ship to the rest of the world, beginning in Brentwood, Williamson County, Middle Tennessee, and beyond. I wonder if you have questions or observations on our text this morning. Yes? My observation is not on the text this morning, it's on the comment you made earlier <clears throat> regarding the symbols. Yes. I don't know how many of you did it, but I did, and I, I was really rewarded by linking to the piece that Rachel gave us, which was a presentation by she and yeah. Meryl Rose. Meryl. I hope you did it, because uh, it was a great piece, well done, professionally done, quite yeah. honestly, yeah. and it's about a 20-minute piece, and I encourage everybody to uh, to go back to that and see it. It was it was quite well done and it was very informative. And quite frankly, it'll make it concluded. I think Rachel said in it that after you go through and understand the symbols in the sanctuary, it makes it a much more worshipful place. It does. So I encourage all of you if you haven't done it to link into that and uh, and see it. it. Takes 20 minutes. Yes, yes. It will greatly enrich your Advent and Christmas uh, if you'll take the time to spend with uh, Rachel and Mary Rose. Uh, yes. Anything else? Steve. Yes. Uh, my sister-in-law, Martha, and I were talking about this yesterday. In the scripture reading, it says that Abram built an altar and God appeared to him. Yes. And we were talking about God appearing to Moses in the burning bush mm -hmm. and to Moses on the mountain. But both of those times, you really couldn't see God. You saw right. a burning bush and a, the, how was that described? I can't remember. A cloud. Was it the cloud? Yes, I think so. Do we have any idea about God's appearance here to April? That was that that's what I felt as I read his appearance to Abram. I wish I knew more about this. Was it just words? Um, was it just thoughts, promptings? Um, was it a dream or was it a vision that one has in the daytime, an altered state of consciousness? Um, 
we don't know. That's why um, I would like to know the rest of, of that story. It is interesting in Stephen, uh, the uh, deacon sermon in Acts 7, he said um, that the Lord appeared to Abram in Ur of the Chaldees. So it was that far back before they made the journey to Haran uh, that he appeared to him. And that suggests something visual uh, rather than just something verbal. But uh, yes, <laughs> I'd like to know more. Anyone else? Thank you.